I don't know if you guys heard that music fading in the background, but um, that was the first track I saw to skydive in. It was Boston, more than a feeling. I don't know if anyone remembers that. But that was back in the 70s. So we're going to start. Just last stragglers coming in. Hey, Chris. Um, yep, my name's Pete Allen. Um, what a huge honor it was to be presented with that uh, award earlier. Actually teared up a little bit when they said the lifetime membership. I hope to make full use of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the topic this, the, this afternoon, oh, for good afternoon, thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate it, I'm grateful. Um, the topic is flocking, and the talk should be about 20 to 25 minutes. I've got plenty of space for a QA and a at the end. So if you've got questions, please just hold off until the end and uh, we'll get to those. I'd like to make some disclosure as well before I start, and that is I'm a PD-sponsored athlete and I work for Flight One. What that means is, is that I see, the, my, I see stuff through that lens, you know, PD canopies and as a Flight One instructor. This is not a sales talk. I know that there are excellent canopies out there and excellent canopy coaches other than what I jump and who I work for. So I encourage you to try anything on that field. But just wanted to get that disclosure out of the way so it didn't seem like a sales talk. My goal is to inform you guys and girls. So what is flocking? Flocking is basically playing together under canopy without the need for touching. Now, what I, did, what I uh, wanted to do was dive into, after what, what, what it is, is where did it come from, a bit of the history behind it, and, and how can you start? My introduction to the sport was my mum and dad dragging me onto a drop zone, hey mum and dad, um, at the age, well, in the early 70s, before I could start skydiving, they dragged me onto a drop zone, and as part of that, I went to a couple of demos. And one of those demos was by this team. Yep, that picture is supposed to be that bad quality because it comes from the mid-70s. Um, that's the RAF Falcons. They uh, used to do this demo, they still, well, we'll talk about that in a second, but they used to do the demo where they would fly together, no contact, close, and land this dynamic stack, no contact, of 10 to 12 people right in front of the public. And it blew me away as a kid, and it's, I still think it does, did a really good job of presenting our sport to the general public. Um, they're still at it to this day. I mean, the, their display, I think, is one of the best displays that you're going to see uh, put in front of the public. And I was super fortunate to be with them on their pre-season training camp in California a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was a real honor to spend some time hanging out with the boys and girls from the Falcons. It would kind of be rude not to mention CF, or crew, as it used to be called. I feel like it's been a massive help with regards to us understanding how we fly our canopies relative to each other. I think we've learned a lot on how to build formations, on how to fly relative, and the inputs that we need to choose in order to get to uh, a particular place in the sky under canopy. But it's about contact. This discipline is all about contact. And I do recommend, by the way, if you haven't tried it, give it a go. It's really fun, and it can really break down a few fears that you have about your parachute not flying anymore. Um, but it does require contact, and it does require specific equipment. And for me, one of the inclusivity elements of flocking is that we're not planning on touching each other, and you can pretty much do it with your regular setup that you jump every day. And a bit of a nod to what's going on in the CF world right now. This is pretty dynamic stuff they're up to at the moment. This is from Paris Valley, 2019. I mean, they're not content with building one formation, they're starting to work on big way sequential. This is just a short part of the video. There's about, they do about six or seven points, like from this big way. It's quite impressive to watch. So thanks to the CF brethren and sisters for bringing their information. Where else does it come from? 
Back in the mid to late 90s, <coughs> I was doing four-way with my, with my team, Sebastian XL, and we saw another four-way team. After they finished their four-way, they would get together under canopy and they did a team landing. And that just, I was like, whoa, why aren't we doing that? So on our very next jump, and for the next 10 years, every jump we did as a team, uh, we would get together under canopy, no contact, and land. Uh, and that really gave me a, a real love for flying relative to other canopies. It was safe as well, I felt, because I knew where all my teammates were at any point in time. And also, um, it felt like we were continuing on the flow and the synchronicity of what we were doing in free fall under canopy. It just felt like we were extending the amount of joy that we could get out of that skydive. Another key element in the history of flocking would be swooping or canopy piloting. CP has pushed our sport for athlete development, skills, you know, just looking at what people are doing right now, especially on new equipment, uh, and that brings me to the next stage, is the new equipment side of it. CP, or swooping, has been like the Formula One for skydiving with regards to um, canopy development and harness development. And we're taking all that into our flocking as well, so it would be really rude not to mention that involvement. Another benefit of the CP World Championships or other competitions when there are a lot of uh, swoopers together was at the end of the competition, we would get together and do a big wave flock. This was from way back in 2005 at Lake Wales and it's a 40 wave flock, so formation flock. It's led by the PD Factory team and Icarus Team Extreme uh, put this thing together. I just thought, like one of the very first big flocks, I think, that would have, would have happened on the planet without taking groups. And there's the, the core of the formation, are the Team Extreme and the PD Factory team that put this flock together. So, early steps in flocking. Next up on the list of acknowledgements would be the PD Factory team. The PD Factory team were, when they first started, a formation skydiving team. And a couple of the guys that joined that team come from a strong CF background. I think that shaped where they went in the future. Um, in early 2000s, they became the CP team that we know today. And they're heavily involved in competition. They have strong results at national and world level. Uh, they're also well known for their exhibitions, uh, sorry, expeditions all over the world in some pretty cool places, flocking close to objects. And they've done a lot to push the dynamic side of flocking. What's dynamic flocking? Well, sure, let's just enjoy that photograph first at the uh, Grand Canyon. Uh, there's the team from back then. And then here's a video from a training camp of theirs a couple of years ago. So that's an introduction to dynamic flocking. Um, pretty smooth, huh? Next up, let's acknowledge some of the other groups that are out there pushing the boundaries with regards to flocking. Momentum is a group in the US doing some amazing stuff. I worked with some of them. And with Flight One, we've planned some combined flocking events over the next couple of years. I'm really excited to see what we can do. The planning stages itself is a lot of fun. So I can't wait to get in the air with this gang. Alrighty, why should you even bother flocking? Why, are you, why would you want to go down that route? 
Well, for me, there's two reasons why I start any new discipline or try anything a little different in this sport. The first reason is I'm stoked. I've seen the clickbait on Instagram, and I'm like, I want to have a go at that. I'm really interested in it. The second reason why I start stuff is I'm scared. I have an irrational fear of something, and with any irrational fear, it blinds us to what we actually should be scared of. So if I'm frightened of something, a new discipline or a new parachute, I want to do as much as I can to understand. Knowledge dispels fear. And do you not find it a little crazy that in our sport, we're happy to get out of a plane in free fall, be a few millimeters away from each other, flying up to 160 miles an hour, and really not worried about it. And as soon as we're under canopy, if someone's 50 foot away from us, it's like, whoa, see ya. You know, we just like can't wait to get away. And I'd like to change that up a little bit. And I think flocking's the route to do that. Okay, so how do we get started? I looked at the British skydiving regs, and right now, you require a B license with 100 plus jumps to start doing canopy formation. I would say, obviously, pretty similar requirements for, um, for flocking. At flight one, we recommend that you have attended a couple of basic canopy courses and approximately 200 jumps. And your first step, if you want to have a go at flocking, will be to get a coach and do some air-to-air. -air. We do have a flight one course that we've been doing for the last 10 plus years of teaching people how to do air-to-air -air safely. And what you're going to learn, whoever it's with, is Safety brief at the beginning, figure out what the real dangers are, how to avoid them, and how to deal with them. Going to put a radio on you, two-way radio. Gets interesting at times. Um, pretty clear, it's like the, the Bluetooth stuff, cardos, etc., that you use in motorbike communication. Like any discipline, we'll break it down to its components, and you'll look at the exit, how to get set up, how to build, move towards the formation, and what controls you should use uh, and how, how to use them. I find this a really interesting part of teaching people under canopy. When we start skydiving, we're given the toggles and we're told that's how we steer the parachute. Pretty soon you realize, oh, there's some risers. And if you're really good, you'll start to use your body. But it's the other way around, really. We steer it with our bodies, as you know, if you're a getting coaching or if you're a CP. Um, and it's like riding a bicycle. When you first jump on a bike, you think this is the way that you make it work. Very quickly, you realize that it's actually using your body weight, because we're a pendulum, basically, hanging underneath a bit of nylon. And there's that feeling um, when I'm flying next to someone on their first couple of air-to-air -air jumps. We've got radio on, watching side by side, and you start to stretch out. And then they see you drifting backwards. And they're like, well, what's going on? Because you're not doing anything with your toggles, or your risers, or anything. And then you get them to try it. You know, they bring their body in tight. They reduce the drag. They get a little more speed and lift. And they start pulling away from you. And I can still hear them giggling in my ear from the radio, just listening to them getting excited about how active they can be with their body when they're under canopy. So we'll also teach you how to fly relative, where to fly safely, different positions for static formations. And then we'd move on to maybe three ways, just to get a bit more of peripheral vision. Your next step should be to attend a flocking camp. We run flocking camps a few times a year. And whatever camp you're on, I'm sure it's going to go with the same format. I know if I run three camps a year, even if it's with very similar people, I'm going to run through these following things. I want to make sure that everyone's aware of the emergency procedures, the safety areas, where to be, where not to be, um, the order of getting out the aircraft, where to sit during your approach, and um, the, the rest of it. Now, also on that course, we'd remind you of the inputs you need, you know, how to fly from where you're at in order to get relative. You know, in free fall, we know you get flat to go slower, small to go faster, but which input to use to approach a formation safely. And then, as part of that, we'll be introducing you to static builds. Static builds will be some of the first things you do on your flocking jumps. 
and this would be something that we used to show the reference in. This is an X. You can see the lead jumper is the one at the top there. They're out in front, and the other jumpers are set slightly behind and uh, over and above. And this is the way that we'd start to build a large static formation. Again, I'm going to have questions afterwards. What are the dangers of flocking? As with any new skill, we don't know what the dangers are. You know, when I started wingsuiting last year, I thought I knew what it was all about. Then I started wingsuiting and realized that that wasn't the case. It, the Dunning-Kruger effect was in full force for me. And after a few jumps, you start to realize what you don't know. And it's the same with any new discipline. Irrational fear can be blinding or the overconfidence that you get. I'm just going to have a go at this. You know, with a buddy, we're just going to jump out of a... Uh, 10,000 feet at the end of the day and do some flocking. You don't know what you should be scared of. So those two areas, you know, avoid just having a go and being overconfident and avoid the irrational fear that blinds you to the real dangers. Basically, I'm recommending that you start with a coach. The environment that we're flying in. As skydivers, I think we do a pretty poor job of understanding the environment that we're in. As a paraglider, I'm learning more about weather than I've learned in 43 years of non-stop skydiving. In the last three years, boom, my head's exploding with information. Those guys and girls really understand the environment. And I think we could do a better job with that as well. And by flocking, where you are doing high pulls, you're opening up at 10, 13,000 feet, you're exposed to that environment. You're exposed to different wind strengths, different directions, cloud layers, etc. And that's a real danger if you're not aware of it and you're only aware of the lower winds. So know the environment. Let's imagine you're on a flocking camp. There's six of you. You're getting out of the aeroplane. As you open up, you also need to be controlling yourself so that you don't start wandering into someone else that's opening up right next to you because we're all getting out just a couple of seconds after each other. So the housekeeping, how to control your position relative to the group whilst you're doing your slider, whilst you're doing your chest straps, and then finding your way to the base. I've seen it a lot of times where I get out, someone opens up, and they're like, oh, I'm just dealing with a problem, and they're just bailing in front of the formation, which can be pretty sketchy. The approach. We are airborne vehicles, and like a boat, we create a wake behind us through the air. So you need to know where your wake is and the wake of the others so that you don't allow the turbulence to affect you or others. And then whilst you're flying relative, you should be as smooth as possible. The same way if I'm in a movement jump or in a wingsuit jump next to someone, I don't want to make big radical moves. The same thing under canopy, it's all smooth moves. If you're next to someone and you start making big moves with your canopy, it's just going to bounce around and make things rather dangerous. Okay. Next up. Things that we don't want to see, wraps and entanglements. We need to have a plan. We don't want to wrap, especially with the modern canopies and how skinny the lines are. Um, but if we do have a wrap and entanglement, we need to check the altitude, communicate with the other person, and through teamwork, figure out a solution. Yeah, and we'll learn all, you learn all that as part of the process of learning the air-to-air. -air. A flock and jump is mostly about what we do from exit through to break off, which is normally about 3,000 feet. And so after that, we recommend, we actually insist, no big turns. We also say that maximum of a 90 degree turn, that's OK, and separate landings, unless the group is really experienced and they're comfortable, they can start to do maybe some 90 degree team landings. Oh, yeah, because we're, because we're opening high, and we're exposed to those upper stratas of winds, there is a chance for an outlanding. So if you're going to do some flocking, make sure that you understand all your outlanding options. We break it down uh, into light and heavy wing loading camps. Wing loading, for those of you I'm sure you all know, but just as a quick refresher, it's pounds per square foot, 150 square foot canopy, 150 pound jumper, it's a 1.0 wing loading. And your wing loading directly affects your horizontal and vertical speeds. Vertical and horizontal. 
and we just create a parameter. It could be any parameter, but the camp that I ran just before Christmas whoop, um, was at a 1.2 to 1.7 wing loading. What kind of canopies you can use? Anything. Could be sapphires, crossfires, silhouettes, sabers. As long as it's compatible, similar wing loading within a parameter, no issues. The type of jumps would initially start off in those static builds, just build in relative to someone, flying your slot, getting comfortable with it, and then as the group gets comfortable, moving between static formations uh, to create like a kind of a sequential jump. We would then, uh, with the light canopies as well, move on to some of the more dynamic dive flows. And in fact, I have one of those here. The next video is from a, a light camp I did just before Christmas. It was with experienced jumpers, most of whom who I'd flocked with before on their little parachutes. And they were really keen to try something with a Sabre 3. So I took my Sabre 3, five more, went down to this drop zone, and with the staff and a couple of fun jumpers, put together uh, a weekend of flocking at that 1.2 to 1.7 wing loading. And this is just one of the example dive flows. No music, so I can talk you through. So that will be a static build. And then we kind of mesh through. Everyone's lined up. We don't have radio on this. This is just all done with uh, body signals, just like you would in freefall. We can mic everyone up with radios. Sometimes I choose not to. Keeps the focus on the action. So we just kind of mesh through from one side to the other. And then popping up and over. And it goes on from there. You know, you can go over and under, through, around. We're only scratching the surface about what is possible right now. And there's a stage break off. So I'm taking one group, the other lead is taking the other group. Now, 1.2 to 1.7 could be lighter. 0.8 to 1.0, this is done with silhouettes and sabers. 170, 190, 210. You can have a pretty insane amount of fun. Look, here's a crossover. Um, in fact, with a bigger canopy, it just makes it a really nice environment to learn about how to do this stuff. It slows everything down, build a bit of confidence uh, before you start moving on to anything a little more dynamic. All right, next up is the heavy loading wing camps. Again, we just set a parameter. The more recent camps I've been running have been 2.2 to 2.9, and we're finding that the heaviest and lightest within that range can still fly relatively comfortable together. The sort of canopies could be JFXs, VLOs, or the Schumann platforms, the layers, the Valkyries, HKs, etc. And we can play with the equipment too. If we want to improve our range within that, we can add weight, we can change our clothing, I can wear something baggy that I get a lot more drag from, slows me down this way, gets me a little bit more pitch, or I can put on tight clothing, which allows me to speed up, get a little bit more lift. Uh, you can also remove the pilot chute bag and slider, as in an RDS, if you want to get a little more speed, a uh, little bit more lift. Or sometimes you can add it. You know, if someone needs to get a little bit more drag from that equipment, they can put their RDS back on. The jump flows are identical to the light wing loading. We'd start with static builds, just getting comfortable with each other, and then slowly but surely move to various formations, and then the more dynamic dive flow that you saw on those videos. The dangers of highly loaded wings flying together, pretty obvious. A lot of extra speed, which means that you need to be a lot smoother under canopy. You know, you can't be jiggling the toggles around like that when you're close to someone. You know, when you when you see in this, you can see people in a variety of different body positions. Like I see Swoop down here in one position, Dewey in another, Ali different position there. 
Josh and myself, we're all using our bodies to fly. Um, also, when you are given your canopy wraps and entanglement brief for a CF jump or at the beginning of flocking, you're assuming that you didn't mind a line being wrapped around you. Have you seen the lines of these little parachutes? They're like cheese wire. You don't want one of those wrapped around you. So that's another element to take into account when you're thinking about flocking with a highly, highly, uh, highly loaded wing. Again, as I said, we don't want to see big turns after a flocking jump. The focus should be on the flocking. And then afterwards, then you can start to think about the landing. A note on the landing. If you are jumping a heavily loaded wing, 2.2 to 2.7, it's all relative, 2.9, you're going to be under canopy for about four and a half minutes if you open at 13,000 feet. Now that means you've got tandems, students, other big canopies around you as you're making your landing approach. So please be respectful of what's going on around you in the environment. So why flock? It's a hell of a lot of fun. Um, for me, flocking is a way for people to drop the irrational fear they have of being under canopy and around others. It's also a way to improve your ability under canopy. For me, it's like tunnel is for free fall, flocking is for canopy. In the tunnel, you're next to your coach, they're giving you instant feedback. Under canopy, when do you get feedback? Virtually never unless you're on a course or unless you're getting coaching for swooping. Whereas when you're flocking, you're right next to someone. You make any tiny move, you can immediately see the change in speed, lift, drag, whatever, of your wing. So every flocking jump, you are learning like it's like being in the tunnel. You're accelerating your learning. You're getting more comfortable and more aware of what's going on under canopy. Do you get it that I really like it? Cool. All right. Um, yeah, and if you can learn how to fly towards someone safely, it means that you have that same skill to avoid them as well and move to a safe space too. It's pretty good value for money as well. Right, well, what's happening now? There are flocking camps out there. As I said, we do them at Flight 1. Momentum are running them. Anyone going to Australia? Guy Zach Ross is running some amazing camps down there for a variety of different wing loading. And flock year camps. These are the things you'll be seeing on the calendar over the next few years. As I said, I'm excited to be joining Momentum uh, for a couple of larger camps. Where is it going in the future? I have no idea. I'm excited to find out. I'm excited to be here on the first steps of it. Um, what I'm going to show you now is a three-minute video of something we did last summer with some friends in Norway. The goal was everyone was flying a mutant harness and um, loaded Valkyries between 2.2 and 2.9, as I said. Um, I'll let you enjoy the view.
cool. So um, that's pretty much it. But before I move on, I want to thank uh, British Skydiving for inviting me to come and talk about something that I'm obviously clearly passionate about. Uh, the PD Factory team, RF Falcons, um, Team Momentum, and then the photographers who do such a good job of portraying our sport, Andy, Bruno, Tim, Moose, Buzz, and Mike. I think, yep, that's it, let's leave that there. So maybe I overran a little bit, sorry about that, but um, I would like to now open the floor to uh, any Q&A that you have about flocking or the mutant or anything that I've been talking about this evening. Do we, we got some mic runners, so if anyone has a question, there we go. Maybe turn it on. It's, okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, you explaining how uh, you recently were, were getting, in, you've gone into flocking, uh, you've experienced uh, paragliding. Um, how would you compare the two? Because there's, there seems to be more speed with flocking, especially in the heavy. Um, weighted arena, mm -hmm. and, but there, there seems to be a, an overlap with the two. So how, how would you separate the two experiences um, yeah. as, a, as somebody who's been an expert or close to an expert in both of those areas? Right. Uh, well, although I consider myself an expert in skydiving, I do not consider myself an expert in paragliding, but I have been doing it with full on for the last three years. So I, I do have a point of reference. Um, I think paragliding is one of those sports that's gonna take a lifetime like I'm finding skydiving is as well to learn. Um, the, they're two totally different sports. What I do under my paraglider, it's a 23 meter wing. It's massive. Um, I fly it like I do with my mutant. Uh, it flies very, very differently, very different response. Um, and as you say, the flocking that I'm doing at the highly loaded is more like a speed fly kind of wing. You know? And everything that you do with your body is super important. It's gotta be very smooth. Uh, so to me, they're chalk and cheese, but because they use this, it's like driving a Formula One car or a motorbike, you know, or a different type of car. It's still driving, it's still flying, and there is some cross-pollination, some cross-training between them. So if you are interested in flying a wing, I encourage you to try paragliding as well. Does that give you a bit of an answer? Thank you very much for the question. Anything else on flocking? Or... Other, other questions? Yes, gentlemen up there. Hello. Blinded a little. Hi, Pete. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, and they're fairly fundamental, fairly simple ones. Quite a simple bloke, really. Um, the type of canopies which are used, I fly a seven cell and have been for about 30 years now, really. So the mix of, because the majority are nine cell. Uh, so would there be a problem between nine cells and seven cells, or is it all, all about wing loading? Um, there is a difference in performance, for sure, but uh, there, is a, there is a crossover. It's like that Venn diagram, where your wing with your wing loading and another, you know, a nine cell version of your wing with a similar wing loading, there will be a crossover where you can fly comfortably together. So it's, if you want to stay with your seven cell, great, stay with it. We'll find something that'll work. Oh, the mic has just dropped out. Hello? Ah, yeah. Right. The, uh, I presume someone must take a lead um, in relation to timing the whole operation from the beginning of the formation until break-off. Is that right? Exactly. For those of you who've done some um, great questions, thank you. The movement jumps, there's always a leader generally that's leading the charge on a wingsuit as well. It's very much the same with flocking. The, the leader would tend to go out first, could also be last, but tend to go out first, and everyone else would formate on them. And then in the lead, if I'm flying in the lead, my goal is to fly smooth on a very um, easy to follow, easy to fly with, where people can go a little bit faster or a little bit slower. And then I would be giving the signals. So if we're gonna do a turn, I'd let people know a turn was coming up, or they'd see my body leaning to one side or break into the next point. So yeah, there is, there is always a leader. And that sometimes goes to two leaders. If the formations get big, instead of having a lead like this, we'll split to a two-person lead. And then uh, there'll still be a main leader from there. Thank you for your questions. Yeah. Jim. 
I'm curious for a, the, an introductory flocking course at Flight One, how many days, how many jumps are programmed, weather permitting, and what kind of estimated cost? Okay, so right there, there's a flocking camp. And uh, again, I didn't want to make this a sales talk, Jim, but thank you for the, the talk. But that could be go for any camp that anyone is running. Um, I'm sure it's, I know it's the same format because I've organized it at some of these other camps. On a flocking camp, first of all, you need to have done some air-to-air -air before you show up and before you register. When you're on the camp, they're either two or three-day camps generally. The cost is very much like going to a, a free-fly camp or a load organizing. It's approximately 100 and something per day for the coaching, plus your jumps and a share of the coach's jumps. Thanks for the question. Anything else on the physics of it or? Yes. On that last video, it was fascinating how close you were flying to the, to the kind of, um, the walls of the, the valleys and things, how much additional risk is associated with that um, from the weather and winds and mm. things, yeah, going wrong quickly. Yeah, nice one. Um, so risk is a huge part of what we do when we're flying in an environment like this, and we don't take it lightly. Uh, whenever we're planning a, a flight through some mountains, we plan everything in, in incredible detail. We look at, uh, first of all, getting a local with knowledge. We had two Norwegian boys that were leading there. Uh, they've grown up in that town. They know the mountains very well from a skiing, paragliding, skydiving perspective, so get local knowledge. But if I'm going to do an XRW line or somewhere in the mountains, it's the same process where I would scope it out very clearly on Google Earth beforehand. I'd plan the lines, and then I would look at the weather conditions on the day and also if possible I'd try and get some idea of the real-time weather conditions either as we're going up in the aircraft or the heli just asking the pilot to give us feedback uh, on what the actual conditions are. There is turbulence around mechanical turbulence and thermal turbulence in the mountains. We try and fly at times of the day when that's not so active. Like if we were going to go in the summer in a place like that or you know when there was other winds around we would bail, and what we did at this camp, because we had three different venues, we would choose the venue based on the weather so that we would have safe conditions. There's a lot of thought that goes into it, yeah. Up the back, Mike Runners, you've got a job going on. Yeah, there we go. Don't let him escape, everyone. <laughs> That five-way formation that you showed a picture of, the middle person was staggered out in front. Could you explain the staggering and sort of the yes. 3D position of the like formation? You mean like the X? So, yes, the X. Yeah, the X. Um, so I think I've got a couple of different... So there's that image there, that one you mean. So that's the dry um, showing the reference where the person in the middle here is that person out front there. And then you have that other people are behind, above, and behind, and below. Uh, the goal there is that the leader is out in front and can make any moves, that the, um, the lower jumper is clear, there's no turbulence, and the same with the upper jumper. And the two at the back, they're pretty much over and under each other, leveled up. So if I look down, I should see the, the leading edge of the canopy below my feet. Flip it on, maybe, is it? Not turn it off, there we go. Yeah. Is it just a sort of visual orientation thing then? Yeah, visual orientation, exactly, yeah. Like uh, if you're uh, flying in a, a free fall jump, you know, just where your slot is, where your reference is, exactly the same thing there. Like if I'm one of the side jumpers on this, you know, I'd be, there'd be the leader out in front, and then the two side jumpers there, you'd be lined up like this. I wonder if the momentum picture had Can you see that happening there on that picture? That's pretty much what you've got going on with people stacking back. It's like a, a pyramid. Does that help you? Yeah, I was just more curious if it was sort of a, an aerodynamic thing as mm -hmm. well. If it's sort of well, we're trying to avoid the weight turbulence that you get behind the canopy. So when we build a formation, actually it brings me up to another good point. If you, when you are flocking, you find yourself flying inside the burble quite a lot, but it's normally the body burble. 
as you probably know, that you get awake turbulence from your body as well as the canopy. So the canopy is going to be bouncing around a little bit in the body, but not getting the full uh, wake from the wing. Try and avoid that. Thank you. Pleasure. Oh. So you said, am I on? Yeah. Yep. Um, so you said that there's a quite a wide wing loading difference between people uh, while they're in the high or the low wing loading camp. So does that mean the people on the low wing, lo the high wing loadings are on the rears the whole time and they're just hanging off those, or is everyone quite comfortable flying with each other within those ranges? You have to be ready to fly in any flight mode. When you're on a flocking jump, the same way as if you're on the outside of a, a larger formation of any discipline, uh, you have a range of functional positions that allow you to fly. If someone is you know, on the rears, maxed out, and they're leaning back in their mutant harness the whole time, like you might have seen me, that means that I, I was really having to work at that moment of the jump. It could also be the inverse. I could be on brakes. In fact, looking at this picture here, you can see most people are on a bit of brakes, which is nice because they've got range. Yeah, if we've got someone leading the jump on full speed, that means it's going to be really hard for everyone to stay. So we tend to put it on some brakes and to give everyone a bit of range from there. Um, yes, if you are at the heavier wing loading, you might be flying more in brakes or rears, but you'd also be using your body position too. And, and a note on that, if you're flying your canopy in a flight mode, that doesn't mean that you need to use your strings to make it turn or roll, yeah? that you're using your body to make it roll and, and uh, yaw. So you can set the flight mode with your risers or toggles, and then the body takes over. Does that get to it? Cool. Another question right next. Um, do you have any tips for like preliminary steps for getting into this if you're a prior to B license? Good one. So you want to prepare the road ahead. Get canopy coaching, uh, get some input, really learn to love the act of flying your parachute. And if you don't, um, you probably do already, it sounds like you do, otherwise you wouldn't be asking the question. But just if you really enjoy flying your canopy, understand how it works. Um, I just realized I was giving momentum a lot of screen time there. <laughs> um, but yeah, just learn how it, all the controls from the body, you, learning how to use your body to change pitch, roll, and yaw, learn how the risers work, learn how the toggles work at different flight modes, and that's going to prepare the, the ground well. Watch videos, talk to people who are doing it, attend a seminar like this. Cool. Yep. Hello. Oh, this is loud. Sorry. Um, just before I ask my question, I just, for disclaimer, I've been on a couple of canopy courses the equipment I jump with is perfectly within the guidelines of British skydiving. I often find that my wing loading, let me rephrase that. When I'm on a flight line, I often find that people with similar wing loading to mine jump much smaller and much more performant canopies than what I do because I'm still fairly new to the sports. Yeah. Um, if I want to get into flocking, I'm kind of in between where I can go on a 1.3 wing loading, but people on these courses tend to fly, you know, 150s, you know, fast, responsive canopies. At the same wing loading, are you saying approximately? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, more or less. But my canopy is very big. I can't even make front risers and puts because I, you know, I can't even bring them down. Mm -hmm. What would be your advice in terms of getting into flocking? Do I need to wait and get on more <laughs> adaptive canopies or upsides? I would like <laughs> I to know. think that, um, did you say upsides in there as well? Yeah. It's always an option. Yes, uh, I'm really glad to hear that word. You don't hear it very often in skydiving nowadays, upsizing. I do it a lot. I've just upsized my wingsuit canopy, my reserve, my saber, all of that stuff. Um, so upsizing is a possibility, yeah. Um, I'd like, to, wh wh what canopy are you jumping, just to give me an idea? Generally, so it's always a 190 
And like a crossfire or a sapphire? No, so I've jumped spectres, savers. Okay. Pulse. A, a whole range. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the kind of canopies I do wing, um, lighter wing loading camps with. I would like to give it a go. If you're within the requirements of, uh, you know, of joining a flocking camp, if you've done some air to air, come and join on one of our wing loading camps. Might need to lose a bit of weight. <laughs> Say again? Might need to lose a bit of weight. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to join us. As I said, inclusivity in this, you know, you should be able to do it with your regular skydiving equipment. And we can always help you out as well. On a lot of these camps, we have access to other wings that as long as we're not downsizing someone, we can maybe try a different wing out. Right. Thank you. Pleasure. Ken. Uh, there's a question really um, about when you're planning a formation. Are you positioning people so that they sort of default to a place of safety, like in terms of you make it such that the person's having to work to stay in position and when they stop working, they separate. Um, so you're kind of like a spit of imbalance in there so that as, as you release a control, you move into yeah. a clear air. And I'm thinking I've, I've flown formation in aircraft yeah. and you, you always set the trim up mm -hmm. such that if anyone drops the ball, mm -hmm. your tendency is to, to move apart, not together. Yeah, we, um, on a formation, depending on how it's stacked up, let's say we use the X that we mentioned that we saw before. If there's the center of the X, there's the upper echelon, the lower echelon. They have very clear exit strategies. So for me, if I'm the leader, my exit strategy is forward and out, and I'm on a little bit of break so I can do that. And with my mutant, I can pop out the way. The up levels, so this person would be up and left, this person up and right, down and right, down and left. And that, then we would plan that. And in fact, we're finding we're doing that on every static formation. We're figuring out where the safe areas are. And if we change formations, it could change. So you then need to know on that particular formation what your exit strategy is. Thank you. Cool. I think we're good. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your patience and your questions. It's been super fun talking about it. And get in touch. <laughs>